I am Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the editor and VP of Streaming Media and the program chair for Streaming Media West Connect. Normally we'd be in Huntington Beach right now, but as we all know, there's absolutely nothing normal about absolutely anything right now. So we're happy to be here with you virtually and hopefully some people who couldn't come to Huntington Beach or wouldn't be able to join us in person there are able to join us here online. One topic has hovered over everything we've talked about this week and that's been how COVID-19 has affected every aspect of the streaming industry, whether it's remote production, whether it's the uh, production of content that is ground to a halt, whether it's consumer habits changing and the amount of streaming that people are viewing skyrocketing in the home, the costs that are associated with that for OTT providers, it's all on the table, everything has changed and we've got a great panel today to talk about what's changed, how those changes are likely to impact the long-term uh, health and growth of the streaming media industry. And so I'd like to begin by asking our panelists to just introduce themselves briefly, who you are, what do you do? And let's start with uh, Michelle Abraham, Michelle. Hello, I'm Michelle Abraham. I'm a senior analyst with Kagan, which is part of S&P Global Market Intelligence and does a lot of their media and communications research. I myself have been in the industry for a number of years covering lots of different topics that all touch on streaming technology and more recently into the programmatic video advertising technology space. Terrific, thanks. Uh, next up, our speaker, Ewan, I, I almost did it. I almost said Ewan McGregor. I'm sure you've not, that wouldn't be the first time that's happened, but Ewan McLeod from HBO Max, Time Warner. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, I wish it was Ewan McGregor, maybe. But um, <laughs> um, Hi, my name is Ewan McLeod. I'm the Vice President of Customer Experience Engineering at HBO Max, and my job is to create customer experiences and product features that really shine a light on the amazing stories that we create at HBO. Wonderful. Uh, Peter Wharton from Tag Video Systems. Peter, tell us a little bit about Tag. Hi, Eric. Thanks for being here. Thanks for letting me be here. So Tag Video Systems provides end-to-end -end monitoring solutions all the way from live production to OTT delivery. So we really help make sure that we have the quality of experience that audiences deserve. And it's really nice to be here with you guys today. It's great to have all of you. And uh, I'm going to round things off with John Gigendak from Hub Entertainment Research. And John is going to kick things off by setting the stage a bit and presenting some of his company's findings for how COVID-19 has changed consumer habits and consumption. We had a presentation earlier in the week about the state of the streaming industry, but it was very much an inside baseball. How have things changed in terms of cloud versus on-prem hardware and software? Real geeky stuff. John's going to talk more about how things have affected the consumer. So, John, I'll pass it over to you. Great. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everybody, for uh, being here today. And uh, just by way of introduction, my name's John Giegengeck, and I am the founder and principal of a company called Hub Entertainment Research. Uh, we've been around since 2013, and we do uh, research for the industry to figure out everything that we can about how technology is changing the way that people find choose and consume entertainment content. Um, and as you might imagine, uh, one of the things we've been spending a lot of time on lately is, is COVID. It's changed everything about people's lives in general. Um, and, and probably the change to entertainment is, is more dramatic even than lots of other things. So uh, what I thought we'd start off with here is just uh, show you guys some findings from uh, one of the recent COVID studies that we've done. So we've done uh, several different uh, studies on COVID. And uh, what I'm gonna show you here now is uh, findings from, mostly from a study that we did back in June, uh, but really just to see how is the enforcement of lockdown, the change in people's everyday habits, uh, impacting the way that they uh, consume entertainment of all kinds, but especially, especially video entertainment. And one of the things that we have found, and this probably isn't going to be a surprise, is that people are using a lot more uh, TV providers than they had been before COVID. So uh, every April, and in fact, in every survey, we ask people to tell us all the different TV platforms that, we, that they use. And then one of the things that we do on the back end is to uh, uh, 
is to figure out what's the per capita number per person that they're seeing. So uh, in April 2020, we found that the average person was looking at, uh, was using 4.8 different TV providers. So that could be uh, cable, it could be a virtual MVPD, it could be any of the streaming platforms, it could be direct to consumer or free uh, ad streaming, it could even be an antenna. Uh, but the, the number of those platforms was already climbing back in 2018, but you can see that the number really accelerated uh, up 30% just from April of last year. And so people are using more platforms in general uh, as new ones like Disney Plus or HBO Max come out, but the, the pandemic has really turbocharged that. John, we're still seeing your first slide. There we go. What do you got now? Is yep, that it? We've got, we got the second slide now. If it helps, John, put it, the little icon on the bottom right will give you full screen so people can maybe see it a bit better. Yeah, there you go. What do you got, what do you got now? We still see the slides on the left rather than just the main slide. Huh. You still, you seen the main, seen one slide now? I, I think that's fine. I think okay. that's fine, yeah. Pleasure's a Zoom. Uh, so one thing that we found is that the number of providers being used is even higher uh, among people who are the most impacted by the pandemic. So among people who say they are strictly social distancing, they don't leave their house uh, for anything except the necessities, those people are using on average 5.3 different TV providers and among those who have had kids at home uh, with school canceled because of the pandemic, it's, it's the highest of all. So they're using up to seven different TV sources just within one household. <laughs> now, another thing that we're finding is that the pandemic is, is creating conditions that even in normal times are associated with a shift in TV providers. So it, it's really hard to get people to change their habits uh, when it comes to anything, but especially with regards to TV. Uh, but the pandemic is creating conditions where those habits do actually shift and there's the opportunity for uh, a change in how they watch TV to occur. For uh, one example, uh, the pandemic is causing people to move. So in June, among those who have moved in the past year, a third of them said that uh, the pandemic had a lot to do with their decision to move. And another 22% said it had a little something to do with it. But in general, People, when they move, TV providers are one of the things that they change, and especially these days, it's one of the days when traditional, uh, a time when traditional pay TV is more likely to be swapped out for something online. And when we asked people who said they had cut the cord, cut their cable or pay TV cord uh, since the pandemic began, 25% uh, of people said that if not for the pandemic, they would not have cut their pay TV subscription. Uh, about half of people who said they had cut it said they would have done that anyway, so it certainly doesn't account for all of it. Um, but with with pay TV churn being such an important factor in changing the industry today, uh, the fact that a quarter of those people are being accelerated, being pushed through by the pandemic, it, it's a really important finding. Um, and it's a trend that's happening anyway, but again, the pandemic is, is turbocharging it. And finally, uh, the pandemic is creating a lot of interest among people in trying a lot of these new providers that are out there. Uh, as we all know, there were a ton of new providers to choose from already before the pandemic even began. Um, but now, now the pandemic is creating uh, time to fill. There's a big vacuum and people are filling that in many cases by sampling some of these new providers that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. So since the pandemic began uh, in March, 28% of people say they've added at least one new TV service since that started, which is a lot higher than we normally see for that period of time. Um, one big change, and this has gotten lots of attention in the news, it's something we've been following as well, is uh, the willingness of people to pay to get content at home that they might otherwise have gone to a theater to see now that the theaters are closed. 75% uh, of our respondents said they were at least somewhat interested in paying a premium, so as much or more as they would have had to pay to see it in a the theater, to see theatrical movies released at home uh, in lieu of being at a theater. 
And this interest, again, is even higher among people who have uh, kids at home because of the pandemic. There's a 20 percentage point difference between them and the folks who don't have it, uh, who don't have kids at home. And really interestingly is that uh, people who expect their income to drop because of the pandemic, uh, one might assume that they would actually be less likely to spend on things like premium video or be less likely to uh, add a new TV service. But in fact, the reverse is true. Uh, people who expect their income to drop are more likely to say they're interested in paying to see some premium content at home. They're also more likely to say that they've added a new platform. And uh, this is part of a really interesting finding that we're, we're looking into is that people actually look at TV uh, not as a luxury, uh, but almost as part of an austerity package where maybe they know they're going to be spending more time at home and they're investing more money uh, to make that palatable. So it, it suggests that as we work our way through uh, the recession driven by this pandemic, that TV might be a lot more resilient than a lot of other uh, types of industries. So just to sum up some of the biggest things that we've seen, uh, one is that people are using more platforms since the pandemic has started, which means there's a greater need for aggregation, uh, platforms that can kind of help them manage all that content from one place. It's also created new content habits to serve. So things like people's willingness to play, uh, pay for digital video, uh, sorry, for theatrical releases at home. And it's accelerated a shift from retail to digital. So we've seen many, many more people who used to only buy uh, video or you only used to buy video games, for example, at retail stores, uh, now investing in hard drives and creating new behaviors where they're downloading that stuff uh, to store it digitally, which is a habit that they're gonna keep when this all is over. And Eric, we'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, John. I think that's a great, like I said, setting of the stage for what we're going to talk about for the next 45 minutes or so. It gives us some real baseline numbers for how exactly COVID has impacted um, consumer behavior and OTC services and how services can respond to those changes. And so I'd like to jump into that next. Uh, Michelle, there are hundreds of streaming services out there. In fact, Tim Natividad from Roku was on the other day and said that Roku alone has 14,000 channels. Um, and so, you know, there's tremendous competition. Streaming is no longer a sideline for media companies, whether they're doing a deep, uh, direct to consumer service, whether it's catch up TV from a broadcaster or newscast from a local broadcast station or smaller niche OTT services. What actions are you seeing providers take to stand out from the noise? And I apologize for my dog who did not get the memo to be quiet during the session. We're definitely seeing more of the media companies um, offer direct to consumer services. I think AMC Plus was announced uh, yesterday. Discovery has said it's going to launch a direct to consumer service. So, uh, as John mentioned, consumers are interested in, uh, are actually paying attention and seeking out a lot more. And that just, you know, the media companies are providing many more of those streaming services. But with the pandemic, although the streaming has increased for those that have already launched, uh, you know, they, uh, and it's causing, it's giving them a lot more uh, hours um, where consumers are viewing their content that also has increased their costs, not so much for preparing the content itself, but certainly when you're delivering it to more people, whether it be you're providing more DRM licenses, um, you know, definitely more CDN costs and delivering the content. So we've really seen a, a pretty good focus and the streaming technology companies that I've talked to uh, uh, focus on the part of their customers in making sure that they're operating as cost effectively as they can, whether that be, uh, you know, working with their providers to see what can be done, um, and also using a lot of the analytics tools to understand what can be done to help them um, using things like content aware encoding in order to reduce the bandwidth required for their streams. So definitely uh, more of a focus now on making sure that the service is delivered cost effectively as opposed to a few years ago where it wasn't nearly as, the streaming part of the business wasn't nearly as important to the overall business as it is today. Yeah, and, and um, I might add something to that. I think it's really important as streaming becomes more important that we maintain the same kind of quality and focus 
across all of delivery platforms and not treat it as a stepchild to what might have been broadcast or cable and satellite before. So we're, we're actually seeing companies create unified workflows that, that put the same value on their streaming and make sure they have the same quality of experience for everything they do and also for both linear and nonlinear. Because customers, you know, if, if they watch something and they don't get the right experience, they're not going to have an understanding of whether it came over the air or it came over cable or if it came over streaming. They only see the experience. Eric, you're muted. Thank you. I knew it would happen sooner <laughs> or later. I'm trying to get all of my technical errors into one session and I saved them all for the last session. Um, let's talk about that streaming landscape and what consumers are seeing. You know, there, if you look at the OTT services on the market now, they really fit into three major categories. There's the big media companies like Warner, Comcast, Disney, and Viacom. Uh, there are VC driven and acquisitions like Vudu, Tubi, and Zumo. And then there are the tech-driven and pure streaming plays like Netflix, Amazon, and Quibi. Do we remember Quibi? We'll get to that later if we have time. Um, and we're lucky here to have Ewan from HBO Max. Uh, Ewan, congrats on the launch, which was a few months ago, but it's still exciting. Yep. And certainly launching during this era could not have been easy, given everything that was going on with COVID-19. A launch like HBO Max's is never easy to begin with. But tell us a little bit about what it was like to launch a service like that with all of your teams working remotely? Sure. Well, first of all, we are incredibly uh, pleased with the launch. Um, our engagement is definitely up. Uh, I think at the last AT&T um, um, earnings call, John Stankey announced that our average number of weekly hours viewed on the platform was 70% up from HBO Now. Um, I think that demonstrates that we have a very strong library and we're definitely broadening the appeal of the, the product um, to more family members. Um, it was very challenging during COVID. Uh, for sure, it wasn't without some, um, let's say, hurdles we had to overcome. Um, but as they say, those obstacles become the way, not in your way. Um, from a content perspective, I think HBO has proven you know, this year we won uh, 30 Emmys, which is the 20th year, consecutive year, where we've won more Emmys than any other streaming platform or any other network. So we've got an incredibly strong library. Um, from a tech perspective on launch, um, we didn't have any major issues on launch day, which is a, is a credit to the team, and also uh, a credit to the platform that had already been built for HBO's existing tech stack, that obviously was built for scale for shows like Game of Thrones. Um, I think when COVID uh, reared its ugly head, we, we were actually quite prepared because obviously we had in the past looked into how we could um, have sort of distributed teams. We already have offices, you know, across the US. Um, and um, I think the, the stage of the cycle we were in or the life cycle of launching a product, it was towards, it was obviously happening, COVID came in at the beginning of the year and we were kind of at a point where we'd done a lot of tech demos and really um, hardened what we were gonna do from a development perspective. So going into COVID, in a way, there were many disadvantages, but there were some advantages. Having people in lots of different locations on lots of different devices, on lots of different networks, uh, actually became a little bit of an advantage because we were actually testing, obviously, in a very uh, sort of diverse sort of geography and diverse network. So in that way, it helped. And I think from a um, challenge perspective, um, you know, we do have agile engineering practices, and you know, one of our one of our sort of cultural foundations is to be agile. So I think the team adapted very quickly and it, and it was very impressive how we got through how we got through COVID. Yeah. So very pleased with what we did. And it's a credit to the people, I think, just to adapt quickly and uh, work through it. Thanks for the insights into how a major OTT platform handled things from the inside. Let's look again from the outside and how consumers can find services uh, in an increasingly crowded landscape. Obviously, HBO Max doesn't really have the problem of people 
uh, of of alerting people they exist. People know HBO exists. It's one of the most recognizable brands in the world. Um, but John, let's turn to you and talk about how consumers find OTT services. As I said, on Roku alone, there's 14,000. Um, do you think we're entering the era, era of super aggregators or at least services that will help us find the content that we have either subscribed to or that is available to us on various services? How do you see search discovery and recommendation happening now, different perhaps than what it was six months ago? Yeah, I think that the need for aggregation among consumers is is growing. And because now the average, you know, we talked about the average person using almost five different providers. Uh, and that, you know, because that's the average across everyone, that means that there are lots of people using that many who aren't necessarily sort of early adopters of technology in general, or really comfortable with, uh, you know, using lots of different inputs or lots of different menus. And so one of the things when we ask people, uh, what makes you choose one provider over another? One of the things that has the biggest impact is uh, simplicity. So simplicity in finding new shows, simplicity in finding the next thing to watch at when I'm done. Uh, and, and I do think that aggregators like, uh, like Amazon, uh, like Roku, but even like traditional cable companies uh, have that ability to, uh, take content from lots of different sources and, and put it in one place where people can find it. We find that consumers who, uh, for example, have integrated Netflix or Hulu with their cable TV uh, on-demand menus, uh, people who do that even once then tend to log into Netflix or Hulu or whatever it is through their set-top box uh, most often thereafter. Uh, and they're also more likely to be uh, satisfied with their cable uh, service and less likely, they say, to to cut the cord in the future. So, so there really is the ability for platforms that can offer that aggregation to uh, make the whole TV experience uh, a lot more, a lot easier to manage for people. Consumers are really excited about all the options that they have, but it's created a first world problem for many of trying to get the most out of all of them in a succinct way. John, can I ask you a question about that? Though, do you think those aggregators? You know, when they do that, they're trusted because I know like when I see this and I see all the things aggregated, I don't always feel that I'm, they're actually giving me a good recommendation engine versus promoting something they want me to watch over top of the other things they're aggregating. Yeah, just, I think that's the big, bigger challenge is who is who is your trusted curation, you know, and, 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 and I would rather trust a really good reviewer on a newspaper perhaps than, an, than a recommendation engine sometimes. Yeah, people don't put a lot of trust in, in recommendation engines. Uh, recommendations are one of the biggest ways, word of mouth is the biggest way that people say they find out about new shows. Uh, but it makes a huge difference if that word of mouth comes from someone that they know versus something that could be perceived as an ad or actually is an ad. Uh, and you're right, the people are pretty jaded about that. Uh, we've seen, you know, Netflix originals, when we first started tracking this stuff, like back when, uh, you know, Little Hammer that, that mostly people didn't remember, but when House of Cards was sort of the first big one that really drew people's attention and there weren't that many Netflix originals, then uh, recommending a Netflix original really had a big impact on people. And uh, people still think that Netflix is one of the best sources for original programming, but now that there's a whole row of Netflix originals when you log in, uh, the idea that somehow this is being recommended, especially for me, because because there's been some thought put into it is is fading. Uh, and people are noticing that they get served Netflix originals first, uh, regardless of whether those might fall into their very specific niche preference for the kinds of shows they like. I'm fairly sure Ewan might have things to say about uh, human recommendation versus algorithms. And then, Michelle, I want to talk to you about what you're seeing streaming companies invest technology-wise into recommendations. But Ewan, talk about uh, HBO strategy and where it fits. Sure, yeah. The picture. So, yeah, so we have, we have a, a product feature called Recommended by Humans. Um, you can go there and look at what humans are recommending right now. It definitely... Um, uh, combines the best of the data that we gather um, and actual just real humans talking about real stories that they enjoy 
And you can probably tell if you go to the recommended by humans uh, uh, experience that it, it is real people talking about the shows they actually love and enjoy. Um, one thing we are trying to um, show is that we can combine the best of machine learning and human creation. And obviously every time you go to HBO Max, you, you, you will see different shows that will show up uh, based on you know what you have watched, uh, obviously, and uh, based on what our human curators are actually um, recommending to watch based on what's going on in, in various different places. So we're kind of combining the best of both worlds, uh, um, which is very different from other providers, I believe. So check out Recommended by Humans, it's pretty cool. Michelle, what are you seeing as you talk to services in the industry and technology providers uh, in terms of improving the types of recommendations that are delivered to viewers and helping them find the content they want to watch? Well, definitely uh, using some sort of algorithms recommendation engine is uh, a part of most services. And John and Peter are right in that uh, oftentimes, you know, there's, there's reasons for what's shown at the top. Uh, you know, there's all of the analytics that uh, support that whether uh, you know there's there's business reasons for recommending certain shows over others that don't necessarily factor into uh, what the consumer has actually watched in the past so uh, you do find that the you know there's a desire to promote new content uh, whether the it necessarily fits with what the consumers watched or not so using a recommendation engine and its algorithms has really become to a certain extent, I think an art as much as a science in making sure that you are pleasing the viewers as much as possible and giving them, you know, you as a service provider, you have business reasons for recommending certain things, you know, new titles that you want to promote things that uh, maybe you're getting paid to promote or original content uh, but there's also, you know, it needs to be mixed in with what you know uh, fits in with what the consumers, uh, the viewers want to watch. But there's also, you know, recommendations, uh, you know, getting very sophisticated based on time of day so that they know that the viewer, you know, in the, in the middle of the morning might turn into a certain tune to a certain type of content, whereas in the evening, they would be tuning into something different. So very a lot of sophistication, but you know, the, the super aggregators then need recommendation engines that are that much more sophisticated because they're dealing with that many more services and that, many, that much more content. And of course, early on in the COVID pandemic uh, crisis, uh, when more stay at home orders were in effect in more states, we saw that the old reliable day parts in terms of viewing in the morning, late morning, early afternoon, et cetera, uh, we're sort of getting, getting flattened, right? That, that, that people were viewing content all throughout the day uh, and, and the types of content they were viewing uh, was, was not as predictable as it had been for a while. And so algorithms, of course, and, and, and recommendation engines have to work to keep up with that. Um, Peter, before we move on, any further comments about recommendation and discovery? Uh, I know you had a question for John earlier, but your thoughts? Not really, actually. I mean, I, I think it's just really important that we find ways to help customers find this content. And, and you know, and I, I know that there's just, there's a lot of content out there and there's some amazingly great content these days. I mean, I think that's that's the beauty of this time is that we, are, we have such compelling content in peak TV, but it's a challenge of finding it. And, you know, and, and so, being able to leverage that recommendation engine is going to be key, I think, for everybody. Absolutely. And in yeah. fact, uh, I'd like to stay on the content discussion for a while. I know that in our outline, and I'm speaking to the panelists now, we had discussion of monetization and business models next. We did cover that in, uh, in detail in our last panel, and we'll get back to it certainly. Uh, but in talking about content, obviously one of the things that's gone on is that scripted content production very much ground to a halt. It is slowly creeping back up, but we actually have a question from the audience that's one that was already on our list, which is, 
are we in any danger of running out of new content? Is the era of peak TV uh, just on pause? Is it over? Um, where do you see the creation of new content coming from? Is it going to be more unscripted content, reality content, um, animation? Michelle, your thoughts on that? It's really all of the above. I think at you know we we've seen during the pandemic media companies be very creative uh, with whether it be repurposing content that had aired before with new commentary, for example, or you know obviously a lot have you know the the summer season is traditionally been one where you see a lot of uh, replays of content that had been shown earlier in the year so although the that seasonality we kind of we we're in the process of moving away from that seasonality but there's still that traditional aspect of it so i don't know that consumers were that impacted yet but definitely we're seeing it in the fall season as production you know, did shut down for a lot of uh, content and is slowly resuming. But then you, you certainly have, you know, content creators that, you know, are, are not necessarily tied to tradition, what we think of as, you know, premium production that, you know, don't recognize any kind of seasonality and continue to produce new content, you know, week in and week out as they always have. So, you know, it, it's a mix, I think, uh, as far as whether there's, depends on where you are on that spectrum as far as whether you've been offering new content or not. Yeah, Eric, um, I think for, for HBO, HBO Max, um, obviously we put a lot of our um, productions into hiatus to protect our teams. Um, we're being very strategic about how we get some of those shows back into production. But at the same time, we've, because we've got this agile mindset, We've had some incredible talent step up, step forward and create some very innovative shows under the sort of social distancing measures. There's a show called Selena and Chef, uh, which features obviously Selena Gomez in her kitchen with a chef in a remote area, and they're you know teaching Selena how to cook. And there's another show called uh, Coastal Elites, which is a scripted um, show um, with people like Bette Midler. So that's all been produced under a sort of safe uh, environment to all the guidelines. So it showed like out of COVID, you can create some really innovative content. And I think we'll see more of that across the whole industry, to be honest, because under, under those criteria, I think sometimes, as you say, uh, you put an obstacle in your way and it might become the way. So this, this may become more of the new norm, you know, remote production, maybe one or two people in a room who are already in, uh, uh, sort of in, you know, in, in their family or in their household, uh, producing what is actually very compelling content. So those are just two examples of things that we've done just to pivot very quickly. And, and Talon has stepped up and said, how can we, you know, fill in the gap, basically. Yeah, I definitely want to get into talking more about remote production and cloud distribution uh, in just a minute, uh, specifically as it relates to this new type of content. But John, in your research, have you found that consumers are more comfortable with uh, or more, more interested in content that they previously might not have been? In other words, has the sort of, you know, the, the content we're seeing on TikTok and elsewhere and this sort of remotely produced on the fly, lower production budget content um, that perhaps used to get a bit of a bad rap, are consumers watching more of that now? Is it because more of it's available or are their, their, uh, their habits and desires changing? Uh, consumers are watching more of everything now. We've definitely seen that people have, especially for young people, uh, the quality of the content, however they define that comes first. Uh, how expensive the production was is, is sometimes a part of that, but definitely not, not always. So, uh, for a while, young people have been used to watching uh, uh, creators on YouTube, consuming you know, tons and tons of hours of gaming videos, for example, watching other people play uh, video games with their face superimposed in the corner. Uh, they're watching lots and lots of TikTok video. Now, 
Uh, we saw things like the, the huge success of some good news, John Krasinski's show that was uh, produced entirely in his home. And, and especially among young people, we find that uh, in some cases, lower uh, production values are, are perfectly okay. And in some cases, they're even part of the, uh, the appeal. There's a, there's a big uh, affinity that a lot of younger people feel for having sort of a one-to-one -one connection uh, with somebody that they're watching. And that's something that you get from uh, a YouTube influencer or a TikTok star or something like some good news where you feel like you're really getting to know that person. You're sort of seeing inside uh, their day-to-day -day life and you're not, they're not positioning themselves the way some big media organization would like them to look. Um, and I think that's something that, that is one of the several sort of really important changes that will, that will stick around when this is over. Uh, there is going to be a big opportunity to create more of that kinds of content uh, and, and create an experience that engages viewers, especially younger ones, even when uh, we're not forced to produce that way because of the pandemic. I would say with the sports leagues as well, we've seen a number of them launch their own, you, know, you don't really consider them media companies, but they are. <clears throat> even though there wasn't live sports, there were a number of them who developed their own direct to consumer in yep. order in some cases, you know, just to keep their fans engaged while they weren't able to play the matches. So whether it be, you know, interviews, shows with the players or other people involved with the team, or simply to show archival content that, you know, those as uh, we've seen launches of a number of those as well. That's a great example. There was like the NFL draft picks where they had the people in their homes and, and the viewers really thought that was really interesting to see how people actually lived in their own homes and doing this as opposed to where they normally would have done it. And so I, I think, you know, but I'm always curious to see how the technology is serving us to produce content in these times, but also how it's leaving us short and what, what ideas you all might have for how we might actually go further too. You know, where, where, where would, you know, where, where is technology not able to help us continue to create content during COVID? Because it's, we're seeing this ability to do a lot of remote production. We're seeing people working from their homes and doing home studios, and it's getting better every day. It almost feels like we're getting so good at that, it may become the new norm. I, I think there's a chance that it could definitely become, it could become its own sort of genre or, or category. And, and it already has, when you look at, you know, what some of the YouTubers can do today, they're, their in-home production values are, are often better than what you would find like at a at local TV station sometimes. Uh, so the equipment is, is getting incredible. The, the product you can deliver is, is really good, but the, it creates this sort of connection uh, with the audience that you don't get from, from sort of premium TV content where they feel like they have that one-on-one -on -one connection with the person creating the content. And that's something that is, is both, unique and really appealing to a certain segment of the audience. I'd like to ask, you know, I know, Peter, you just threw the question about how the changes in technology are changing the content, but I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the changes in technology themselves. Obviously, between remote production and cloud distribution, uh, those were things that were already we were already seeing more of before COVID hit. We've only seen it accelerate in the last six months. Um, how has that accelerated technology pace impacted the industry from your perspective? And do you think it'll slow down again once uh, we get back to normal, whatever that looks like? Well, actually, one of the biggest shifts is this move to the cloud. And the most difficult part of that, the Holy Grail, was actually doing live production because live production imposes a lot of challenges that make the cloud hard to do, you know, from high bandwidth and very low latency and lots of signals. Um, it makes that one of the most difficult things, but we're seeing this actually happen. The companies are already going down that path, are able to accelerate that and move very quickly. Um, I've seen other companies, for example, that you would have thought would have done that too, but haven't because of the uncertainty of the cloud. There was already enough uncertainty with COVID that when they implemented technologies to help them get through this current pandemic, they didn't use the cloud because it was just one more uncertainty they didn't want to throw on top of that. 
But now that we're seeing others doing it successfully, they're more likely to make that shift as well. So we're seeing this happen. Um, again, the biggest challenge was live production. We've now seen several companies start releasing live production systems in the cloud, which means you can stand up things immediately, you know, and it's definitely going to change how you produce content going forward. Um, and it's also going to change the economics of it too, because we're no longer having to build big control rooms and infrastructures or even remote trucks that get consumed for days at a time doing a show that only lasts for an hour. Now we can actually only run it for an hour and then use it for something else. So it's, it's actually going to enable even more live production. And, and, and people work from home. And there was a great photo of uh, uh, Glenn Weiss, the director of the DNC convention, sitting in his home with multiple screens around him and his bare feet and shorts producing a major <laughs> television event. You know, And I, I, think, I think that just shows that we've, we're making this transition in a way. And, and you could even see if you watch the convention and, uh, how every day it got better and better. And they understood more what worked and what didn't work. You know, to the point by the last day, it, it, it almost looked as good as it would have in normal times. So I, I think that that's part of the interesting thing too, is is, is that we're getting so good at this um, that, that is changing how we will do things in the long term. Yeah, Eric, I think the the um, the cloud was ready for full remote production and editing and such like. But I think there was maybe some resistance to go all in and when COVID came along it, it, it enforced that almost and it has proven to be a very useful tool obviously and not just the cloud but also things like the ubiquity of you know high speed networks like 5G. I think for MBA All-Stars Shaquille O'Neal um, was like doing a live production with a 5G uh, cellular network on AT&T with like a 4K um, recording device and, and the output was amazing. So, um, you know, like, you know, you obviously need the network to support that and you need the cloud. Uh, and obviously you need people to be um, willing to use those tools because it comes with some challenges. Um, but I think with COVID it really um, meant people kind of had to use those tools and it's turned out to be very advantageous. So yeah, I think it will be the new norm, um, you know, so people can work you know, remotely on pretty huge events like RNC, DNC, major sporting events, yeah. Peter, you mentioned the economics uh, on the production and distribution side are changing. Uh, I do want to turn back to the economics of the OTT market in general. John, uh, in, in your research, you mentioned that the number of TV sources is up something like 30% or more over last year. Do you know the breakdown of of AVOD advertising supported versus subscription. I mean, obviously there's all these acronyms, right? AVOD, SVOD, FAST yeah. for free ad supported TV, hybrid models, transactional. What sort of breakdown are you seeing and has that changed in the last yeah. six months? Well, so one of the biggest things we've seen is that, so almost all of the increase is being driven by uh, streaming providers until about the last year. So now about one in, uh, every three respondents say they use at least one free ad supported platform. So Pluto or Tubi or Crackle uh, that they use it at least, at least some of the time. Um, but another huge thing that's happening is, is that people are stacking multiple S pods. Uh, so in the most recent wave uh, 50% of everyone that we talked to said they used at least two of the of the four biggest streaming platforms at the time netflix hulu uh, amazon or disney plus so so 50 percent of people used two or three or even all four of those um and the implication of that is is huge uh because any one of those uh platforms offers in the high hundreds if not thousands of titles uh and as I said at the beginning, people are using more and more of those. And the only thing that isn't expanding that fast is just the amount of time in the day uh, to watch television. So the fact that people are stacking those multiple SVODs means that uh, every piece of content now has to compete harder to get a slice of that disposable time uh, pie. And, and feeding back to what we talked about at the beginning, it makes figuring out where people discover these shows and why they choose some over others uh, even even more critical than it was before. 
What about the Avon side of things uh, in terms of uh, the sustainability of uh, Avod models, free-to-air models that are ad-supported. Michelle, uh, what do you see? How, how is Avod doing overall? And do you think the fact that there are uh, will more streamers watching TV mean that Avod services are getting an advantage that they might not have had prior to the pandemic? Definitely. Um, I would say in the, <clears throat> the market in general has seemed to have shifted somewhat focus from a monetization aspect that, you know, in order to be successful, you had to be subscription based to seeing how um, a number of these advertising supported services have been successful. In some cases, they've been bought by major media companies. But definitely the number of hours of streaming that people are doing now has only helped them if, you know, the, the hours viewed on an AVOD service goes up then they're making more money because they are showing more ads. They have more ad impressions to sell the more hours that are streamed on their platform, unlike a subscription service where it's usually a flat fee per month. So they can be, you know, the revenues are more variable, but they can be doing, um, they can do very well. Uh, there was somewhat of a blip in the second quarter as advertisers themselves pulled back their spending in general, you know, across all sorts of uh, channels of advertising, in some cases because they didn't have the right creative message for the times, or, you know, certainly travel is one segment that is mentioned over and over again as far as, you know, pulling back a lot of its advertising spend. But uh, the one of the areas that has done very well in this in advertising, they refer to it as the connected TV segment because it's the streaming that's viewed on the big screen as opposed to in a, a mobile or desktop environment. And that is one area where the advertising spend increased during lockdowns and has continued because it's following the streaming dollars. And we're now seeing with the media companies owning some of these large advertising services that during the upfronts, that you know where the ad, large advertisers commit some of their advertising money for the next year that the media companies are selling both their their linear tv advertising with their streaming capacity together um you know bundled together so again you know it goes back to what i said earlier that you know the the streaming services aren't an afterthought anymore they're becoming a a bigger and bigger portion of an overall uh, strategy, delivery strategy. Now for an SVOD service like HBO Max, it's obviously all about subscriber numbers, at least in terms of the monetization. Um, Ewan, uh, your thoughts on what's more important right now, uh, subscriber acquisition or retention? Are you worried more about acquisition right now and you're worried about retention a bit down the line or are they both equally important in the short term? Um, I would say they're both equally important. Um, I'm not, I'm not on mute. Good. Um, we we obviously look at engagement as a as a huge driver for uh, sort of the success of our product. Because if people aren't engaged, it's it's unlikely they will continue to pay for a service. I I would expect. Um, but in terms of acquisition and um, um, you know, ensuring people stay engaged and subscribing. We have a very good sort of marketing team that rely a lot on our data. We obviously have um, a very compelling slate of content that, 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 that is difficult to compete with, in my opinion. Like shows like Raised by Wolves, if you haven't seen it, it's just astronomically a beautiful production. And those, those kinds of compelling stories that have really been around since the beginning of, you know, time, be it drawings on cave walls or, you know, people telling stories, that, that, that in essence is what we're trying to shine a light on in HBO Max through our products and through our customer experience. So um, if you can do that successfully, I think it's easy to um, acquire customers and it's easy to retain customers. But I wouldn't say one's more important than the other. Unlike most things, we're very agile and that's our approach to everything. And we will focus our efforts depending on what's going on in the market and the, um, and the industry. Uh, so yeah, I wouldn't say one's more important than the other. The, we, we, we basically adapt to 
try and find a good balance to be 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 in the best position, which is a which is obviously should be a winning position because we're kind of combining the accumulation of the creative art that's been very successful the last couple of years and the huge scalability of our platform. And obviously we're also going to launch some AVOD um, next year, beginning of next year, we plan to launch AVOD for, for as, a, as a platform. We are almost to the end of the hour. We've got about eight minutes left and I'd like to spend these last eight minutes asking each of you, I guess, to gaze into your crystal ball and with the events of the last six months in mind, with the changes that have come about due specifically to COVID, as well as the trajectory that our industry has already been on, what do you think are the biggest trends, both positive and negative, that we're going to see in the future of the OTT industry? Feel free to answer from you know, a, 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 a perspective that is directly relevant to you and your company in the case of HBO and uh, Peter from Tag Systems, and of course, John and Michelle from a research perspective. What do you think are the trends to watch out for the, the opportunities and challenges that, that face the industry? Um, Anyone want to volunteer to go first before I assign it? I don't. I don't mind going first. I'm. I'm very much into futurism. Mm -hmm. um, I read a lot about future planning and uh, future forward sort of things. Um, they say you can't predict the future, but you can definitely build scenarios based on some environmental constraints that you might be able to understand quite clearly that will be around in five years. Um, I guess a perfect. I can do a, a sort of. Uh, analog uh, or analogy would be like, you know, if you took a rocky mountain in the middle of the highlands of Scotland, you know it's probably going to be raining there in five years and the water is going to flow down that mountain and it's probably going to flow down the easiest path and you can kind of predict those paths. So they say you can't predict the future, but you can definitely build scenarios or um, uh, cases where you know things are going to happen probably in a certain way. So we obviously within HBO Max, I can tell you what we're looking forward to. Um, we're obviously, we're, we've announced we're launching internationally, um, South America first. We're obviously building a global organization with offices in Amsterdam, London, Budapest, Sao Paulo, um, obviously offices all over the USA, Seattle, New York, um, Los Angeles and Barbank, et cetera. Um, I mean, the, you know, becoming, Creating a scalable solution is obviously business 101. You know, the more scale you have, the economies of scale. So launching internationally obviously makes a lot of sense. Launching AVOD obviously makes a lot of sense. Um, I think I think if others have the um, sort of um, economic scale to do that, they will do that. Um, I think, as I've said probably a couple of times, it's when you've got the accumulation of the creative talent and the sort of innovative technologists that we've shown at HBO Max, because, you know, seamlessly launching was no small feat. And, you know, that was proof that we can do this from a technical perspective. I think in the past people always said HBO has great content, but maybe, you know, maybe not so much, you know, they're, they're not known for their innovation or their technology. We've proven that now through launch. We'll prove it through AVOD, we'll prove it through our international expansion. Um, and I think we'll be in a very good position. I can't comment on others, uh, but I know a lot of people work in the industry. And obviously, uh, if you innovate and you have some great stories to tell, uh, that, that, that's so compelling. People are going to want to watch that content. So, I mean, you know, all, all that we do is really try and shine a light on the great things that we already have. So um, I'm certainly looking forward to that. Um, Excellent. Thanks, Ewan. Peter, uh, from the technology perspective, particularly, what do you see the future holding and how has COVID impacted the trajectory of that future? Well, for a lot of linear channels, live television is what really drives them. So we're seeing more and more the ability to do live television in the cloud and through remote production. Um, I, I, you know, when sports comes back, that's really going to transform that, especially. So I do think that's going to be a big change. And honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if down the road we see somebody like Amazon Prime Video end up bidding on Olympics or something because, you know, with their much higher PDE ratio, their cost of acquiring some of that content is going to be very competitive against the traditional companies that they're fighting. So I think we're going to see some really interesting changes. The other thing I think is interesting is that 
we're now building systems where we're much more aware of who's watching what, when, and how. And that kind of, and we'll see more interactive content where maybe what the viewer responses are or engagement, we'll be able to actually use those metrics and interaction to actually change the content while we're producing it. I, I think we haven't really seen that really take off yet, but you know, gamers are used to being involved directly in what the content looks like on screen and television's been primarily passive. And I think we're gonna start seeing a middle ground emerge where the viewers are actually going to affect the content as it's being delivered. You know, and I, and I don't know what that looks like yet. Somebody who's far more creative than I is gonna come up with that, but, but that's now capable. Excellent. John, your thoughts on the future? Uh, I think that, that people are going to be used to uh, consuming content from lots of different sources the way that they were before and the way that the pandemic has accelerated that. And I think that the biggest uh, opportunity right now and the most important uh, priority for lots of companies is to bear in mind that what consumers really need the most is, is simplicity. So their TV as a, as a product has never been more compelling, uh, which is really good because it's facing a lot of, of competition from things like video games, for example. Um, but, but people do the, 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 the biggest frustration, if you can call it a frustration, it's a, it's a first world problem. Uh, the biggest frustration they have is, is managing all of these different options and, uh, making it simple to find the next thing they're going to watch and making it simple to ideally access lots of these different, uh, platforms without having to change their remote control or without having to manage lots of different passwords and, uh, if that problem is solved, consumers are happier, they watch more, they consume more, uh, and, and the brands get bigger audiences and the best content wins its way to the top. So, so I think that's going to be the, the, the biggest competition, you know, for people's eyeballs and people's time in the future is who can kind of deliver the simplest experience and, and make it so their content can be found that way too. And Michelle, you get the last word. <laughs> Well, I think the trends we've already seen are just going to continue. So, you know, more people watching streaming content, fewer households subscribing to pay TV, which creates its own issues for those that are uh, whose business models are based on uh, pay TV. But I don't think there's ever been a better time as far for a uh, as far as being a viewer of content as you know you can you can get whatever your particular interests are you can find content that uh, matches those interests um, whether you're a news junkie whether you're you know really into viewing sports whether you know it, it really doesn't matter everything's out there so from a streaming service provider perspective you know there's there's a lot of competition and needing to make sure that you're uh, you become profitable that it, like i said these are no longer sidelines that the, the services are profitable is even more important in order to remain in business because we've certainly seen some of those that have started up uh, not be able to continue their service and you know being shut down or being combined in with other things so you know basically we see the the same things that are already happening you know just continue and uh trends that uh i think we've got you know definitely on the the box office side i think like john had mentioned earlier you know changing in the in the way that we're consuming you know traditional theatrical releases even which I think took a pandemic to happen, but I, I don't think there's any going back there either. All right, that's a great place to close. Thanks again to all of our panelists today. Thanks to all of you in the audience for watching all week at Streaming Media West Connect. And thanks to our sponsors, our panel sponsor, Tag Video Systems, and our platinum sponsor for Streaming Media West Connect, Limelight Networks. Next week, we've got in-depth workshops and the Content Delivery Summit starting on Monday. Thanks, everyone, and have a great weekend. Thanks, sir.